Story 20 30 Ghost Stories by Various Authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Starving Millionaire by S. McCurgy. This story was also in the papers. It created a sensation at the time. Now it has been almost forgotten. The story shows that black art with all its mysteries is not a thing of the past. This is what happened. There was a certain rich European contractor in the central provinces of India. Let us call him Anderson. He used to supply stone ballast to the railway companies and had been doing this business for over a quarter of a century. He had accumulated wealth and was a multimillionaire and one of the richest men in his part of the country. The district which he made his headquarters was a large one. It was a second-class military station, and there were two European regiments and one Indian regiment in that station. Necessarily, there was a number of European military officers besides a number of civil and executive officers in that station. On a certain June morning, which is a very hot month in India, an Indian faker came into the compound of Mr. Anderson, begging for alms. Mr. Anderson and his wife were sitting in the veranda drinking their morning tea. It had been a very hot night, and there being no electricity in this particular station, Mr. Anderson had to depend on the sleepy Punka Kuli. The Punka Kuli on this particular night was more sleepy than usual, and so Mr. Anderson had passed a very sleepless night indeed. He was in a very bad temper. A whole life passed among Indian workmen does not generally make a man good-tempered, and a hot June in the Indian plains is not particularly conducive to sweet temper either. When this beggar came in, Mr. Anderson was in a very bad mood. As the man walked fearlessly up to the veranda, Mr. Anderson's temper became worse. He asked what the beggar wanted. The beggar answered he wanted food. Of course, Mr. Anderson said he had nothing to give. The beggar replied that he would accept some money and buy the food. Mr. Anderson was not in the habit of being contradicted. He lost his temper, abused the beggar, and ordered his servants to turn the man out. The servants obeyed. Before his departure, the beggar turned to Mr. Anderson and told him that very soon he would know how painful it was to be hungry. When the beggar was gone, Mr. Anderson thought of his last remark and laughed. He was a well-known rich man and a good paymaster. An order for a one hundred pound on a dirty slip of paper would be honored by his banker without hesitation. Naturally, he laughed. He forgot that men had committed suicide by drowning to avoid death from thirst. Well, there it was. The bell announcing breakfast rang punctually at ten o'clock in the morning. Mr. Anderson joined his wife in the drawing-room, and they went to the dining-room together. The smell of eggs and bacon and coffee greeted them, and Mr. Anderson forgot all about the Indian beggar when he took his seat. But he received a rude shock. There was a big live caterpillar in the fish. Mr. Anderson called the servant and ordered him to take away the fish and serve with eyes open next time. The servant who had been in Mr. Anderson's service a long time stared open-mouthed. Only a minute before there was nothing but fish on the plate. Whence came this ugly creature? Well, the plate was removed and another put in its place for the next dish. When the next dish came another surprise awaited everybody. As the cover was removed, it was found that the whole contents were covered with a thin layer of sweepings. The Kansama, the servant who serves at the table, looked at Mr. Anderson and Mr. Anderson at the Kansama with a wild surmise. The cover was replaced and the dish taken away. Nothing was said this time. After about five minutes of waiting, a third covered dish was brought. When the cover was removed, the contents were found mixed with stable sweepings. The smell was horrible, and the dish was at once removed. This was about the limit. No man can eat after that. Mr. Anderson left the table and went to his office without breakfast. It was the habit of Mr. Anderson to have his lunch in his office. 
a consama used to take a tiffin basket to the office and there in his private room mr anderson ate his lunch punctually at two p m today he expected his tiffin early he thought that though he had left no instructions himself the consama would have had the sense to remember that he had gone to the office without breakfast and so mr anderson expected a lunch heavier than usual and earlier too but it was two o'clock and the servant had not arrived mr anderson was a man of particular regular habits he was very hungry and the thought of the beggar in the morning made him angry too he shouted to his punkakuli to pull harder it was a quarter after two and still the consama would not arrive it was probably the first time in twenty years that the fellow was late mr anderson sent his chaprasi peon to look for the consama at about half past two a couple of minutes after the chaprasi's departure mr atkins the collector of the district was announced a collector is generally a district magistrate also and in the central provinces he is called a deputy commissioner he is one of the principal officers in the district in this particular district of which i am speaking there are two principal government officers the divisional judge was the head of the civil administration as well as the person who tried the murderers and all other big offenders who deserved more than seven years imprisonment he was a bengal brahmin mr atkins was the collector or rather the deputy commissioner he was the executive head of the district he was also the district magistrate mr atkins came in and thus explained a sad incident which mr anderson's consama had met with as i was passing along the road in my motor car your young man came in the way and was knocked down the man is hurt but not badly he had been carrying a tiffin basket which was also knocked down as a matter of course and the car having passed over it everything the basket contained in the shape of china was smashed up the man has been taken to the hospital by myself in an unconscious condition but the doctor says there is nothing very serious and he will be all right in a couple of days now mr atkins was a great friend of mr anderson they had known each other ever since mr atkins arrival in india as a young member of the civil service that was over twenty years ago he had at first been in that district for over seven years as an assistant commissioner and this time he was there for over three years as a deputy commissioner but mr anderson was very hungry the story of mr atkins had given him the second shock since the morning he therefore used language which no gentleman should have done and with great vehemence threatened to prosecute mr atkins for rash driving etc mr atkins was a very good-natured man he knew the temper of mr anderson but he had never seen mr anderson so angry before he therefore beat a hasty retreat wondering whether anderson had not gone mad he would not have told anybody what happened in anderson's office if he had known the starving condition of the millionaire but as it happened he repeated the fine language that anderson had used in the club that same evening everybody who heard his story opined at the time that anderson was clearly off his head mr anderson and his wife were expected at the club but they did not turn up when mr atkins went home he got a letter from anderson in which the latter had apologized for what he had said in the office that afternoon in the letter there was a sentence which was rather enigmatic if you know what i'm suffering from atkins you will be sorry for me not angry with me i pray to god you may not suffer such the letter had evidently been written in great haste and had not been revised mr atkins did not quite understand the matter and he intended to look up anderson the first thing next morning mr atkins thought that anderson had lost some of his money he knew that anderson never speculated still he might have suffered a heavy loss in one of his contracts he telephoned to mr anderson at his house but was informed by one of the servants that the master had gone out in his motor-car at six in the evening and was not back 
now let's see what happened to mr anderson after he left his office at about four in the afternoon he went home and expected some tea but no tea arrived though it was six the consama was in the hospital the cook was called and he humbly offered the following explanation as soon as hazor your honor came back i ordered the kidmatgar the cook assistant to put the kettle on the fire this is the ordinary duty of the kidmatgar there was a bright coal fire in the stove and the kidmatgar put the kettle upon it the kettle should have boiled within five minutes but it did not your humble servant went to investigate the cause and found there was no water in the kettle we put in some but the kettle had in the meantime become nearly red hot as soon as it came into contact with the cold water it burst like a bomb fortunately nobody was hurt there was of course a saucepan to heat some water in but the cold water had got on to the stove and extinguished it it would be another half an hour before tea was ready he added mr anderson now realized that it was not the fault of the servants but the curse of the indian faker so with a sad smile he ordered his motor car and thought that he and his wife had better try the railway refreshment rooms when his chauffeur was going to start the engine mr anderson expected that there would be a backfire and the chauffeur would have a dislocated wrist but there was no accident the engine started as smoothly as it had never done before mr and mrs anderson went to the railway refreshment rooms there they were informed that no tea was available a dead rat had been found under one of the tables in the first class refreshment room and as plague cases had been reported earlier in the week the station master had ordered the rooms to be closed till they had been thoroughly disinfected the whole staff of waiters with all the preserved meat and oilmen's stores had been sent by special train to the next station so that the railway passengers might not be inconvenienced the next station was eight miles off and there was no road for a motor car i had expected as much said mr anderson bitterly as he left the railway station i would go to captain fraser and beg for some dinner he is the only man who has got a family here and will be able to accommodate us he said to his wife and so they started off a five-mile run to the cantonments there was some trouble with the car on the way and they were detained for about an hour and it was actually eight thirty in the evening when the andersons reached captain fraser's place why instead of going home from the railway station mr anderson went to captain fraser's place himself could not tell when the andersons reached captain fraser's place at half past eight in the evening mr and mrs fraser had not come back from the club but they were expected every minute it was in fact nine when the captain and his wife turned up in a hackney carriage they were surprised to see the andersons they had heard the story told by atkins at the club anderson gave them his version of course captain fraser asked them to stay to dinner he said i am very sorry i am late but it couldn't be helped when returning from the club my horse was alarmed at something the coachman lost control and there was a disaster but thank god nobody is seriously hurt their carriage had however been so badly damaged that they had to get a hackney carriage to bring them home in india especially in june they are not particular about the dress so captain fraser said they would sit down to dinner at once and at a quarter after nine they all went in to dine the kinsama stared at the uninvited guests he knew that something had gone wrong with anderson sahib the soup was the first thing brought in and the trouble began as soon as it came captain fraser's kinsama was an old hand at his business but somehow he made a mess of things he got so nervous about what he himself could not explain that he upset a full plate of soup that he had brought for mr anderson not exactly on his head but on his left ear well the reader would understand the situation there was a plate full of hot soup on mr anderson's left ear the soup should have got cold because it had waited long for the captain's return from the club 
but the cook had very prudently warmed it up again, and it had become very warm indeed. Mr. Anderson shouted, and the consama let go the plate. It fell on the table in front of Mr. Anderson on its edge and rolled on. Next to Mr. Anderson was Mrs. Fraser, and there was a glass of iced water in front of her. The rolling soup plate upset the glass, and the water and the glass and the plate all came down on Mrs. Fraser's lap, the iced water making her wet through and through. She was putting on a muslin gown. She had to go and change. Mrs. Anderson at this point got up and said that they would not spoil the Fraser's dinner by their presence. She said that the curse of the Indian faker was on them, and if they stayed the Frasers would have to go without dinner. Naturally, she anticipated that some further difficulty would arise there when the next dish was brought in. The Frasers protested loudly, but she dragged Mr. Henderson away. She had forgotten that she had had her lunch, and her husband had not. While going in their motor car from Mr. Fraser's house to their own, they had to pass a bazaar on the way. In the bazaar there was a sweet meat shop. Mr. Anderson, whose condition could be better imagined than described, asked his chauffeur to stop at the sweet meat shop. It was a native shop with a fat native proprietor sitting without any covering upon his body on a low stool. As soon as he saw Mr. Anderson and his wife, he rushed out of his shop with joined palms to inquire what the gentleman wanted. Mr. Anderson was evidently very popular with the native tradesmen and shopkeepers. This shopkeeper had special reason to know Mr. Anderson, as it was the latter's custom to give a dinner to all his native workmen on Her Majesty's birthday, and this particular sweetmeat vendor used to get the contract for the catering. The birthday used to be observed in India on the 24th May, and it was hardly a fortnight that this man had received a check for a pretty large amount from Mr. Anderson, for having supplied Mr. Anderson's native workmen with sweets. Naturally, he rushed out of his shop in that humble attitude. But in doing so, he upset a whole dish full of sweets, and the big dish with the sweets went into the roadside drain. All the same, the man came up and wanted to know the pleasure of the sahib. Mr. Anderson told him that he was very hungry and wanted something to eat. Certainly, Huzor, said the Hallway Indian confectioner, and fussily rushed in. He brought out some native sweets in a dona, cup made of leaves. But as misfortune would have it, Mr. Anderson could not eat anything. There was any amount of petroleum in the sweets, how it got in there was a mystery. Mr. Anderson asked his chauffeur to proceed. For fear of hurting the feeling of this kind old hallway, Mr. Anderson did not do anything then, but scarcely had the car gone two hundred yards when the dona, with its contents untouched, was on the road. Mr. Anderson reached home at about half-past ten. He expected to find no dinner at home but he was relieved to hear from his bearer that dinner was ready. He rushed into his bathroom, had a cold bath, and within five minutes was ready for dinner in the dining room. But the dinner would not come. After waiting for about fifteen minutes, the bearer, butler and footman combined, was dispatched to the kitchen to inquire what the matter was. The cook came with a sad look upon his face and informed him that the dinner had been ready since 8.30 as usual, but as the sahib had not returned, he had kept the food in the kitchen and come out leaving the kitchen door open. Unfortunately, Mr. Anderson's dogs had finished the dinner in his absence, probably thinking that the master was dining out. In a case like this, the cook, who had been in Mr. Anderson's service for a long time, expected to hear some hard words, but Mr. Anderson only laughed loud and long. The cook suggested that he should prepare another dinner, but Mr. Anderson said that it would not be necessary that night. The chauffeur subsequently informed the cook that the master and his wife had dined at Captain Fraser's and finished with sweets at Gopal Hallway's shop. This explained the master's mirth to the cook's satisfaction. What happened the next day to Mr. Anderson need not be told, 
it is too painful and too dirty a story the fact remains that mr anderson had no solid food the next day either he thought he should die of starvation he did not know how much longer the curse was going to last or what else was in store for him on the morning of the third day the bearer came and reported that a certain indian faker had invited mr anderson to go and breakfast with him how eagerly husband and wife went the faker lived in a miserable hut on the bank of the river he invited the couple inside his hut and gave them bread and water here was a clean healthy looking bread after all and mr anderson never counted how many loaves he ate but he had never eaten food with greater relish and pleasure in his life before after the meal the faker who evidently knew mr anderson said sahib you are a great man and a good man too you are rich and you think that riches can purchase everything you are wrong the giver of all things may turn gold into dust and gold may by his order lose all its purchasing capacity this you have seen the last two days you have annoyed a man who has no gold but who has power you think that the deputy commissioner has power but he has not the deputy commissioner gets his power from the king the man whom you have offended got his power from the king of kings it is his pleasure that you should leave the station the sooner you leave this place sahib the better for you or you will starve you can stay as long as you like here but you will eat no food outside this hut of mine you can try you can go now and come back for your dinner when you require it mr anderson came back to the faker's cottage for his dinner with his wife at nine in the evening early the next morning he left the station and never came back within a month he had left india for good the hospitable gentleman of the station who had asked mr and mrs anderson to have a meal with him will never forget the occasion this story though it reads like a fairy tale is nevertheless true all the european gentlemen of j knew it and if any one of them happens to read these pages he will be able to certify that every detail is correct in this connection it will not be out of place to mention some of the strange things of the once famous hassan khan the black artists of calcutta fifty years ago there was not an adult in calcutta who did not know his name and had not seen or at least heard of his marvellous feats i have heard any number of wonderful stories but i shall mention only two here which though evidently not free from exaggeration will give an idea of what the people came to regard him as capable of achieving and also of the powers and attributes which he used to arrogate to himself what happened was this there was a big reception in a government house at calcutta now a native of calcutta of those days knew what such a reception meant all public roads within half a mile of government house were closed to wheeled and fast traffic the large compound was decorated with lamps and chinese lanterns in a manner that baffled description thousands of these chinese lanterns hung from the trees and twinkled among the foliage like so many colored fireflies the drives from the gates to the building had rows of these colored lanterns on both sides besides there were colored flags and union jacks flying from the tops of the poles round which were coiled wreaths of flowers which also served to support the ropes or wires from which these lanterns were suspended the main building itself was illuminated with hundreds of thousands of candles or lamps and looked from a distance like a house on fire from close quarters you could read long live the queen written in letters of fire on the parapets of the building and could see the procession of carriages that passed up and down the drive so artistically decorated and wonder that the spirited horses did not bolt or shy or kick over the traces when entering those lanes of fire there were no electric lights then in calcutta or in any part of india no motor cars and no rubber tired carriages on a reception night lots of people come to watch the decorations of government house nowadays government house is illuminated with electricity 
but i am told by my elders that in those days when tallow candles and tiny glass lamps were the only means of illumination the thing looked more beautiful and gorgeous the people who come to see the illumination pass along the road and are not allowed to stop the law is that they must walk on and if a young child stops for more than a half a minute his guardian friend nurse or companion is at once reminded by the policeman on duty that he or she must walk on and these policemen of calcutta unlike the policemen of london are not at all courteous in their manner or speech so it happened on a certain reception night that hassan khan the black artist went to see the decorations and while lingering on the road was rudely told by the policeman on duty to get away ordinarily hassan khan was a man of placid disposition and polite manners he told the policeman that he should not have been rude to a ratepayer who had come only to enjoy the glorious sight and meant no harm he also dropped a hint that if the head of the police department knew that a subordinate of his was insulting hassan khan it would go hard with that subordinate this infuriated the policeman who blew his whistle which had the effect of bringing half a dozen other constables on the spot they then gave poor hassan khan a thrashing and reported him to the inspector on duty as chance would have it this inspector had not heard of hassan khan before so he ordered that he should be detained in custody and charged the next morning with having assaulted a public officer in the discharge of his duty the inspector also received a warning but he did not listen to it then hassan khan took out a piece of paper and a pencil from his pocket and wrote down the number of each of the six or seven policemen who had taken part in beating him and he assured everybody a large number of persons had gathered now present that the constables and the inspector would be dismissed from government service within the next hour most of the people had not seen him before and not knowing who he was laughed the inspector and the constables laughed too after the mirth had subsided hassan khan was ordered to be handcuffed and removed when the handcuffs had been clapped on he smiled serenely and said i order that all the lights within a half a mile of where we are standing be put out at once within a couple of seconds the whole place was in darkness the entire government house compound which was a mass of fire only a minute before was in total darkness and the street lamps had gone out too the only light that remained was on the street lamp posts under which our friends were the commotion at the reception could be more easily imagined than described there was total darkness everywhere the guests were treading literally on each other's toes and the accidents that happened to the carriages and horses were innumerable as good luck would have it another police inspector who was also on duty and was on horseback came up to the only light within a circle of a half mile radius to him hassan khan said go and tell your commissioner of the police that his subordinates have ill-treated hassan khan and tell him that i order him to come here at once some laughed others scoffed but the inspector on horseback went and within ten minutes the commissioner of the calcutta police came along with half a dozen other high officials inquiring what the trouble was about to them hassan khan told the story of the thrashing he had received and pointed out the assailants he then told the commissioner that if those constables and the inspector who had ordered him to be handcuffed were dismissed on the spot from government service the lamps would be lighted without human assistance to the utter surprise of everybody present including the high officials who had come out with the commissioner of police an order dismissing the constables and the inspector was passed and signed by the commissioner in the dim light shed by that isolated lamp and within one second of the order the entire compound of government house was lighted up again as if someone had switched on a thousand electric lamps controlled by a single button everybody who was present there enjoyed the whole thing excessively with the exception of the police officers who had been dismissed from service it appeared that the commissioner of police knew a lot about hassan khan and his black art
how he had come to know of hassan khan's powers will now be related most of my readers have heard the name of messrs hamilton and company jewelers of calcutta they are the oldest and most respectable firm of jewelers probably in the whole of india one day hassan khan walked into their shop and asked to see some rings he was shown a number of rings but he particularly approved a cheap ring set with a single ruby the price demanded for this ring was too much for poor honest hassan khan's purse so he proposed that the jeweller should let him have the ring on loan for a month this of course the jewellers refused to do and in a most un-englishman-like and unbusinesslike manner a young shop assistant asked him to clear out he promptly walked out of the shop promising to come again the next day before going out of the shop however he told one of the managers that the young shop assistant had been very rude to him and would not let him have the ring for a month the next day there was a slight commotion in hamilton's shop the ring was missing of course nobody could suspect hassan khan because the ring had been seen by everybody in the shop after his departure the police were communicated with and were soon on the spot they were examining the room and the locks and recording statements when hassan khan walked in with the missing ring on his finger he was at once arrested charged with theft and taken to the police station and locked up at about midday he was produced before the magistrate when he appeared in court he was found wearing ten rings one on each finger he was remanded and taken back to his cell in the jail the next morning when the door of his cell was opened it was found that one of the big almiraz in which some gold and silver articles were kept in hamilton's shop was standing in his cell everybody gazed at it dumbfounded the almira with its contents must have weighed fifty stones how it got into the cell was beyond comprehension all the big officers of government came in to see the fun and asked hassan khan how he had managed it how did you manage to get the showcase in your drawing-room inquired hassan khan of each officer in reply to the question and everybody thought that the fellow was mad but as each officer reached home he found that one showcase evidently from hamilton's shop with all its contents was standing in his drawing-room the next morning hassan khan gave out in clear terms that unless messrs hamilton and company withdrew the charge against him at once they would find their safe in which were kept the extra valuable articles at the bottom of the bay of bengal the jewellers thought that prudence was the best part of valour and the case against hassan khan was withdrawn and he was acquitted of all charges and set at liberty then arose the big question of compensating him for the incarceration he had suffered and the ring with a single ruby which he had fancied so much and which had caused all this trouble was presented to him of course messrs hamilton and company the jewellers had to spend a lot of money in carting back the showcases that had so mysteriously walked away from their shop but they were not sorry because they could not have advertised their wear better and everybody was anxious to possess something or other from among the contents of these particular showcases it was in connection with this case that hassan khan became known to most of the european government officials of calcutta at that time End of story 24